Welcome back to the Blister and Muck podcast. I'm Jenny Mason, your host and the creator of the Blister and Muck series. This week, Yana's bizarre lab experiments finally yield some fantastic results. But it's not all smooth saline, because Blister's reward is more like a curse. To keep out of trouble, he'll have to think outside the box. Before we charge into this week's episode, I wonder, have you ever kept a secret? To be clear, I'm not talking about concealing private information, like the swipe pattern to unlock your phone, or your social security number, or your mom's debit card number, or how you store your clean underwear. It doesn't matter whether you fold them, roll them, or smash them up like bugs. Private information stays private because it's nobody else's beeswax. When I say secrets, I'm referring to information you could share with others, but you deliberately set aside, seal off, and hide from other people's knowledge. It's not that you forget to tell. You choose not to tell someone something. Odds are good that if you're listening and you're a human, you have kept or are currently keeping some kind of secret. Researchers find that people are capable of keeping secrets when they are as young as three. But most kids aren't really good at keeping secrets until they're at least six or seven. In the early 16th century, Andreas Vesalius began keeping a huge secret. It was a dark, ugly secret that Vesalius had to hide from public knowledge. Even though what he was hiding would go on to change the world and ultimately save countless lives. Other people living in other places and in other times shared the same horrible secret. Some of these people were doctors. Some were teachers. Some were artists, like Leonardo da Vinci. Vesalius was working as a professor in the Italian city of Padua. Back then, many cities were built with defensive walls around them. At night, soldiers locked and guarded the city entrances. Vesalius ventured beyond the walls one evening. Darkness descended. The city gates locked tight, effectively trapping Vesalius among the night-roaming thieves, murderers, and bandits. He would not reach his cozy bed that night. Vesalius crept to the grounds where criminals were executed and found the prize he'd hoped for. A body burned at the stake. I did not flinch, Vesalius later wrote. I did not flinch from going out at midnight among all the corpses and pulling down what I wanted. He goes on to say, The brigand had provided the birds with such a tasty meal that the bones were completely bare and bound together solely by the ligaments. Vesalius then proceeded to disassemble the body so he could sneak it back into the city and into his home. By now, Vesalius was quite the pro at snatching corpses. He began the secret chore back when he was a university student living in Paris. Many a night, he scavenged bodies from cemeteries or the gallows where criminals were hung. Why would Vesalius, or anyone, do such a dreadful thing? Quite simply, because Vesalius was a doctor. A surgeon, to be precise. He was in charge of battling illnesses and injuries in order to save people's lives. However, in these past eras, doctors and surgeons were expected to know everything about the human body without ever actually studying the human body by dissecting it. The public did not disapprove of dissecting dead bodies merely because it's kind of gross. Religious laws decreed the human body to be a sacred vessel. To cut it open after death was a desecration of God and all the heavens. To be sure, no one in the medical profession regarded the human body and the human soul as trash. Nonetheless, they were stuck. How could Vesalius perform a successful surgery 
let alone teach others how, unless he explored what was under the skin, under the muscles, and inside the bones. Just imagine what NASA would be like if it relied on astronomers and astrophysicists who were never allowed to look at the stars, planets, or greater universe. For centuries, other doctors and medical students felt as Vesalius did. They could not do their jobs without scientific study of the human body. And so they too undertook Vesalius's secret task. Because they did so, we who live today enjoy the life-saving miracles of modern medicine. All because of a secret. Secrets are such strange creatures. Sometimes keeping a secret might be a good thing, like when you're planning a surprise party for a friend. But what if at some point that friend directly asks you, hey, are you planning a surprise party for me? If you answer, no way, then has your secret become a lie? And if you're telling lies to your friends, then is the secret still a good thing? In which case, is secret keeping ever a good thing? Episode 2. Secrets are Sweet. Think of something very, very important to you, Yana said one day. Blister thought about appetizers, then soups, then breads, then main courses, and was envisioning a grand assortment of chocolate desserts when the lights on the machine boggled. A spark spat into the jar. Yana made frantic notes. Perfect. Keep thinking about whatever you're thinking about. Blister closed his eyes and thought all about chocolate, but no more sparks snapped into the jar. Despite her obvious disappointment, Yana gave Blister a sugar-glazed berry tart. After that, Yana began interviewing Blister, or maybe interrogating was the better word. She asked him all kinds of personal questions. Blister gave more lies than truths. Nonetheless, several sparks flashed inside the jar when she asked Blister to talk about his family. When she asked him to describe his best friend, an electric bubble squeezed out of the funnel before Blister could refute having any friends. The iridescent sphere clanked to the bottom of the jar where it gleamed and glowed. A blurry image flickered inside the bubble, reminding Blister of motion pictures, the brand new technology he'd seen when he snuck into Black Rust's first movie theater. Before the image focused, the bubble burst, splattering the jar with a sludge of crackling goo. Yana jumped from her chair, Owl hooting and hawk screeching. She danced around the jar. She telephoned for a cab, and when it arrived, she and Blister climbed inside. The driver followed her directions to Le Petit Gâteau, where Yana bought a heaping basketful of muffins, cookies, and a new invention called a donut. Blister devoured more than his stomach could hold, but he had hardly made a dent by the time the cab pulled up to the cathedral. Perhaps it was the rush of sugar from the donuts that made him say, Can I keep the rest? You earned it, Yana's earlier excitement reignited. What progress we made today. I expect a breakthrough tomorrow. And then we will show the world. Now Blister was more than certain he was suffering from some kind of delirious sugar rush because he thought he saw Yana's nose swell out and curve down like a bird's beak. She pulled out a handkerchief and covered her face as she sneezed and sneezed and sneezed. She also tugged down the netted veil of her claw-covered snake hat. 
Pardon my allergies, she said. Off to go. Bye-bye. See you tomorrow? Blister asked. He hopped out of the cab, and Yana lowered the basket down to him. I don't think so, no. She shook her head. A few thin, downy feathers dropped from under the veil. I'm not feeling bell at all. Let's take a day off. Ta-ta. Then she clapped the cab door shut and commanded the driver to leave. Blister could not dwell on the strange severity of Yana's allergies for long. He had to devise a scheme for stashing all those baked goods. In what place would Muck or Seltzer not find them? More to the point, how was he going to keep the wharf rats from smelling them? Blister lugged the basket inside the cathedral and left it in the nave. He rushed up the stairs to the belfry. Seltzer and Horchata were out of the nest, running through their daily exercises. No squats! Ready! And one, and two, and three! Setzer continued counting while squatting up and down. Horchata merely stared at something a million miles away. Occasionally, she blinked. Run in place! Ready! Hip, 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 hip! Seltzer tramped his claws in a steady, stationary jog. He panted and gasped for air. Hiya, Seltzer, Blister said in his cheeriest tone. Seltzer scowled. We're not splatter painting anything, and I've made sure there are zero feathers anywhere. Who cares about all that? Blister pretended not to care. I didn't come up here to harp on you. For once, Seltzer added. Ah, come on. I need you to do me a favor and fetch Muck from Putresca's. Why? Seltzer crossed his wings skeptically. Because, um... Because why? Well, um, I'll tell you. Because tonight we're having a party. Seltzer clapped and smiled. A party? Really? Yes. Blister smiled too, even though he worried his mouth was going faster than his mind. The four of us are going to celebrate. What's the occasion? Um, uh, friendship, of course. That's real nice of you, Blister. Seltzer started for the stairs, but stopped. I almost forgot about Horchata. I'll watch over her while you're gone. Seltzer thanked him and hurried down to the cathedral crypts and the tunnel leading to the sewers. Blister practically carried Horchata up into her nest. Stay, he ordered. She blinked. He rushed to the spiderweb, calling for Spindle. As the arachnid squeezed out of a crack in the wall, Blister said, Can you cut down your web? I need to use it. Spindle obliged without protest or question. Blister zoomed down the stairs with the spider's web trailing like a cape. He tipped over the basket to empty it, then netted the web around the goodies. He chucked the basket into the moldy, stinking crypts. Then he lugged the muffins, cookies, and donuts up to the belfry. He found Horchata pecking at the stone floor. The tin can with spindle inside rolled around her in a tattling loop. Blister returned the befuddled bird to her nest and thanked Spindle. He emptied several candle boxes, shoved the goodies inside, and arranged a wall of other boxes to hide the secret stash. Spindle bit Blister's tail. Ow! Blister rubbed the bite mark. I'm not breaking any rules, Spin. This is... Just a surprise for Muck. Don't let on that you know about it or you'll ruin it. He wagged his finger so emphatically, Spindle sulked. Blister! Muck's jolly voice echoed up the stairwell. We're back! Seltzer's call also rang up the stairs. Blister clapped the dust from his paws. He congratulated himself on all his hard work thinking all he had left was to set up the candles ejected from their boxes. But when he turned, there was one donut he had overlooked. 
Horchata pecked at it. Blister gasped and yanked his ears down. As Muck and Seltzer emerged from the shadowy stairwell, Blister jammed a candle in the donut and yelled, Surprise! Hours later, when all the candles were lit and the donut devoured, Seltzer repeatedly thanked Blister with hearty wing pats on the back. Believe I had the wrong impression of you all along, he said. Blister pshawed the praise and yawned in earnest. Seltzer sang, For he's a jolly good fellow, as he guided Horchata up the terraced boxes to bed. Spindle ran his tin can in celebratory circles. Muck sang along, his moist coal eyes fixed on Blister. What? Blister asked through another yawn. Oh, um, nothing, Muck said. Just supremely surprised. You broke the ban on food in the belfry. For me. I didn't break a ban. I just... <sighs> made an exception. A strict one-time exception. Muck nodded. Care to contemplate the constellations? Sure. Blister rubbed his eyelids. They seemed thicker and heavier than wet wool. Muck scooped Spindle out of the can and carried him to the window casement. Before he could climb up, Blister stopped him. Wait, he said, as he shoved a candle box against the wall under the casement. For you. Muck blinked, completely dumbfounded. Thank you, he said at last. Rather than scrape and scrabble and chuff and puff his way into the casement, Muck hopped deftly from the top of the box. I'll move it back when we go to bed, he said when Blister sat beside him. Just <sighs> leave it. As if imitating the stars, the electric lights across the city flickered and blinked. Diligent days make for run-down rats, Muck said. Blister nodded. How is your training going? For reasons Blister couldn't explain, both the question and the answer to follow made his insides feel salty. Entirely estimable. Although we have limited lengths of time to practice. Madame Putresca is so short-handed these days. Several operatives luckily located a cache of Dr. Van Sangfroyd traps, but a few of them wound up unluckily trapped. Dung for brains, Blister snirked. Not at all, Muck said. Evidently, cat cadres hide nearby, only to spring out and force vulnerable victims into the malleable mesh. Just like how Seltzer said the police horse was trapped, Blister mused. Indeed, yes. And, if you recall, I was similarly surrounded the day we met. Muck then rattled off all the tasks he'd undertaken in the caverns, all the operatives he now knew, and all the creatures he had helped. He was about to wax poetic on Madame Putresca's tremendous teaching talents when he stopped short. To him it seemed something more than fatigue shaped Blister's slouch just then. Finally, he said, I was thinking of taking tomorrow off. Relish a recess. Flee for festivity. Broker a break. Sounds like a good idea. Perhaps you could accompany me. We could perambulate around the park. Partake in a picnic. Procure a posture of repose, Blister inserted. Huh? Take a nap. Oh, of course. Yes, I'd like that. So what do you say, my good Blister? I say... <sighs> sure. Muck's joyous clapping roused Spindle. The spider climbed off Muck's lap and crawled a crooked path to his web and disappeared in its darkest recesses. Smart spider, Blister said. We should follow his lead. Blister collapsed into his candle box bed. Even through the cover of his eyelids, 
he perceived the golden broth of the candlelight. The pigeons snored soft rrrrs overhead. Nearby, Muck sniff, sniff, sniffed. I say, I can still smell the scent of that delicious delectable, he said. Blister's eyes shot open. He sniffed and detected the faintest trace of sugary delight leaking from the box crammed with his pastry rewards. Thank you again for the sensational surprise soiree. Clearly I was wrong to label you a parsimonious personality. You manifest munificence. You— Yeah, yeah, you think I'm nice. I get it. Good night, Mark. Good night, Blister, Muck chuckled. Soon he was snoring. Blister lay wide awake. His bones buzzed with an ache for sleep. But if Muck could smell the hidden food, then surely wharf rats could too. He got up often to light fresh candles. When he laid down, his ears attended to every sound. A sleepy rustle mimicked ragged paws ascending the stairs. The slightest crunch in a nest imitated brown fangs gnashing. Every snore was really a snort from a crooked, warty snout, sniffing, sniffing, sniffing for food. Has Blister gone mad? He seems to have misconstrued the rules about food in the bell tower. I don't know about you, but I sure hope those hidden treats do not attract wharf rats. Maybe the wharf rat snouts are not as powerful as Blister supposes. Tune in next week to find out if he's beignet misled. And what happens when a couple of pleasure-seeking rats embark on a holiday at Oddvine Park? You'll never miss an episode when you subscribe to the show at blisterandmuck.com. While you're there, you can learn more about Andreas Vesalius and the body-snatching industry. You can also send us your thoughts on keeping secrets. Use the contact form on the website or send an email to contact at blisterandmuck.com. Do you have a fun food joke or tasty bun pun? Send it to us, and I'll share it on the show. Would you like your very own Blister and Muck t-shirt? Visit the Support the Show page at blisterandmuck.com and check out the awesome shirts, hats, tote bags, and face masks. Basin Printing lovingly prints and ships each item right here in the Colorado Rocky Mountain town I call home. A portion of every purchase helps keep this show running week after week. A face mask can cover the cost of music or sound effects. A t-shirt fulfills next month's web hosting fees. And I enclose a special surprise with every order. Special thanks to composer Roland Rudzitis for serving up the Blister and Muck theme song. Additional music from John Bartman and Kevin McLeod. Electrical contraption sounds from That Jeff Carter, M. Wolf. Waker 1 and Gran Torino 551 at freesound.org. Mike Koenig at soundbible.com brought the ocean waves and the flickering city lights, while Lisa Redfern brought the crickets. I am always grateful for my family, friends, and fans. One for one, and all for you, 